On August 14, 1947, a new nation was born. And several weeks later, the infant country, Pakistan, took its place among the free governments of the world in the family of United Nations. Carved out of the subcontinent of India, Pakistan ranks fifth in population among the countries of the world. Its land area is split into two non-contiguous geographical units in the eastern and western sections of what had been Britain's Indian Empire. For thousands of years, even before the time of Alexander the Great, the Khyber Pass has been the traditional gateway to the subcontinent. Today, this ancient route of the invader leads to the border of the free nation of Pakistan. Centuries before the birth of Christ, the Khyber Pass was one of the most important trade routes between Central Asia and India. Caravans still traverse the passage in much the same manner as they did 2,000 years ago. Along the route, fortified villages offered secure shelter to travelers who were under constant threat of attack by marauding tribesmen. Most of the traveling bands that set out to make the difficult trip across the craggy defile were usually well loaded with goods that could bring a considerable price once their destination was reached. As elsewhere in Asia, religion has been a dominant influence in the area which is now Pakistan. After the creation of the new Muslim nation, believers in Islam poured in from India in great numbers. And today, of the 80 million inhabitants of Pakistan, 68 million are Muslims. The people of Pakistan represent a variety of racial stocks. Present-day Pakistanis may trace their ancestry back to Indo-Aryan, Semitic, Mongol, and Dravidian peoples. The average Pakistani is today a swarthy, stocky person. The rugged life in the northwest frontier province has made the Pathans somewhat heavier in build and tougher than their neighbors to the south. The bearing of the frontier Pathans is proud and resolute, and they are regarded as one of the sturdiest peoples alive today. But throughout most of Pakistan, the people lead a less vigorous life. The great majority of Pakistanis live in rural areas. Their daily pattern of existence varies little from the life of their ancestors on the same land generations ago. Throughout Pakistan, most Muslims still dress in the traditional manner. In each locality, there are slight variations in styles, but even urban Pakistanis resist any attempt at westernizing their attire. Some women still cover themselves from sight with the ancient burqa. Everywhere, the face of this young nation today gives evidence of its religious heritage, from which the country derives its strength and unity. But the 20th century has made its mark on Pakistan. Karachi Airport, one of the largest airfields in Asia, is a regular stop on the airline schedules of seven nations. Pakistan, no longer a remote region, is now only a matter of hours from the capitals of Europe. The effects of this link with the world at large are most noticeable in the streets of Karachi, capital city of the young nation. Here, the ancient traditions and customs of the Orient are mixed with modern Western innovations. Seat of the government of Pakistan, Karachi is the hub of an actively functioning democratic state. For Pakistan today is a forward-thinking nation. In the new age of enlightenment, Pakistan's achievements and problems are broadcast to all parts of the land. No longer must Pakistanis be uninformed of their country's development and place in international affairs. Even in the field of journalism, 
Pakistan has a rich background to draw on and a firm tradition to uphold. In an age in which propaganda is triumphing over truth in many parts of the world, Pakistan boasts complete freedom of the press. But these freedoms have not been easy to achieve. Pakistan's history to date has been far from smooth. When Muhammad Ali Jinnah took over the leadership of the country as the first governor general, there were many serious problems to be faced. The task of rehabilitating the masses of Muslims who had migrated to Pakistan was second in importance only to the deteriorating political relations between Pakistan and neighboring India, also freed from British rule. The open hostility between India's Hindus and Pakistan's Muslims made the new Muslim nation's first years very difficult ones. The most vital problem for Pakistan's leader was the defense of the country's borders. The infant nation had to be prepared against attack at any moment. Pakistan's very existence depended largely on adequate military strength, should the dispute with India assume uncontrollable proportions. Well trained and equipped, the Pakistan army remained ready to fight immediately should an aggressor threaten the freedom of the country. To support a military force considered adequate by the government, Pakistan must spend 62% of its national budget. To keep its army well schooled in techniques of modern warfare, Pakistan has retained the services of a number of senior British army officers. These officers have a thorough knowledge of the problems of warfare in that type of country. As a second line of defense, Pakistan has encouraged voluntary enlistments in its National Guard, equipped and trained under the supervision of the Pakistan Regular Army. Formation of the National Guard met with such enthusiastic public response that recruiting centers were besieged by volunteers anxious to play an active part in their country's defense. A women's branch of the National Guard was also formed to be put into service in case of a national emergency. Volunteers in these units perform their military duties with determination and spirit. The chief dispute between Pakistan and India has centered on the Principality of Kashmir in the north. Famed for its beauty and bracing climate, Kashmir has long been the leading resort area of the Indian subcontinent. Because of its strategic location between Central and Southern Asia, Kashmir has been of vital importance to the nations which adjoin it. Behind its peaceful exterior, Kashmir has been a land of conflict. With partition, its Muslim majority was determined to join Pakistan, while its Hindu government acceded to India. After months of military operations for control of the area, a ceasefire agreement between Pakistan and India was put into effect in January 1949 through the United Nations. In April 1950, relations between Pakistan and India were improved considerably by meetings between the prime ministers of the two nations, Liaquat Ali Khan and Jawaharlal Nehru. Disputes over the disposition of territory are not the only perplexing questions. West Pakistan is one of the most extensively irrigated areas in the world, but the headwaters of the rivers which feed that system are in Kashmir and in India. If the principal flow of these rivers were lost to Pakistan, large areas of the country, now fertile, would become arid. Should India divert the course of these rivers, Pakistan's irrigation system would become useless. Since Pakistan is chiefly an agricultural nation, such a move on India's part would be ruinous to the economy of the country as a whole.
farming is the main occupation of the Pakistani. About 90% of the people are engaged in cultivation of the land or in animal breeding. Pakistan's farmers, most of whom own the land they work, are now being advised by the government on modern techniques. But in general, they still use time-honored methods and ancient implements. Food crops play a most important role in Pakistan's economy. Wheat is the principal food crop of West Pakistan, which raises 99% of Pakistan's total of more than 3 million tons a year. This production is more than sufficient for the needs of the entire country, and the balance of the crop, some 600,000 tons, is available for export. More than three quarters of Pakistan's total area under cultivation is devoted to the raising of food crops. Most of Pakistan's 80 million people live in villages which range in size from a population of a few hundred to several thousand. Each villager, by nature an individualist, takes an important part in the life of the community. In most cases, the village is self-sufficient. All minor disputes come before the village council, chosen by the villagers themselves. The council selects a headman from among the group. And when a puzzling local problem must be settled, the council meets in open session. A villager may accuse a neighbor of grazing cattle on his land and the defendant must explain his side of the case to the council. The young nation's concern for its people is everywhere apparent. In the smallest villages, schoolmasters are at work combating illiteracy, teaching the children the fundamentals of the Urdu language. For Pakistan is determined that future generations shall be educated to assume the responsibilities of citizenship. One of the favorite forms of relaxation in the villages is a game of volleyball, a popular sport throughout Pakistan. There are few villages which cannot field a good team. And once the chores of the day are finished, the villagers can enjoy the tunes of itinerant musicians who roam the countryside, entertaining the people who work the soil. Jute is the most important non-food crop, the principal source of financial income to East Pakistan. Called the golden fiber of Pakistan, jute is used for sacking and in carpets, linoleum, and upholstery. More than three quarters of the world's supply of jute is raised in East Pakistan. Because the nation was left without a jute mill when British India was partitioned, the fiber could not be processed in Pakistan. Pending the construction of mills, Pakistan exports the raw fiber. All of East Pakistan's exports are funneled through the deep water port of Chittagong on the Bay of Bengal. Through this port are routed also all shipments bound for West Pakistan, the only surface supply route between the two sections of the country. At Karachi, principal port of West Pakistan on the Arabian Sea, the ships of the great maritime nations discharge their cargoes of machinery. Pakistan is one of the few countries of Asia which have a favorable balance of trade with the hard money nations of the world. For despite the large quantities of machinery and other goods entering the country, Pakistan's exportable surplus of jute cotton, wheat, and other products more than offsets the value of its imports. Transportation facilities to the interior are being improved steadily. 
Amtrak trains like the Pack Mail Express link the major cities of Karachi, Lahore, and Peshawar. Since most of Pakistan's railways fell under the classification strategic at the time of partition, the government had to maintain them without adequate financial return. But the difficult period ended after some seven months, and today the railways are on a sounder operating basis than ever before. The railway repair shops are busy converting coal-burning locomotives to diesel-type engines, for Pakistan is short of coal, and oil is cheaper and more readily available. Pakistan's concern with its progress and future course of action was epitomized by Prime Minister Liaquat Ali Khan. We will never allow our freedom to be taken away. We shall fight aggression wherever it may be. And Pakistan shall cooperate with all those countries who want peace in the world and progress of mankind. To protect that peace and to achieve that degree of progress, the people of Pakistan are united in their resolve to work ceaselessly. For Pakistan is building for the future, and each Pakistani has a stake in that future. The people of Pakistan today are certain that their young country will grow and prosper and will, in the years ahead, continue to win the respect of the other free nations of the world. Time marches on.